Um, so this is a sl uh, Guido visited our lab for a while. Uh, and I think at this point, reverse genetics is working. So there was a little bit of happiness going on here. It wasn't so much of a misery. But uh, we'll talk a little bit. Um, a lot of the data that I'm going to show was actually done by this graduate student. This is Asha. And so I think all of his important work, is that correct? Uh, but most of the important reverse genetics uh, advances that were made by Guido happened in the last 12 months. And, uh, the same thing happened for her a little bit. I think it's been the last 18 months. So almost all the work I'll show today is really work that Asha's done. Um, and um, so she's a second year starting a thir her third year graduate student. So maybe you want to stay and take another graduate. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, so my story's going to be a little bit different. We're, yeah, it's a story about using a reverse genetic system in a more translational way in the long term. But, uh, but we're dealing with a lot of the same questions that are coming up. Um, just how much power, what can you really do with this reverse genetics system? So um, there, are, there are two rotavirus vaccines right now. They're both live oral vaccines. One of them is called Rotorix and one's called Rototech. You give them to children really early during the first few months of age. Um, in, in the U.S., where coverage rates are probably 80 to 90 percent of children are being vaccinated now against rotavirus, um, you can see the change that's happened here in, in the incidence of rotavirus infections that are kid, sending kids to hospitals. They, into hospitals, now we see very few cases of rotavirus-caused diarrhea, where, if the, where the infections or the, uh, the disease is so severe that the kids are being hospitalized. Now, in fact, the problem seems to be more of a norovirus issue. And so, uh, when the reverse genetic system came out. Uh, and we knew rotavirus was working really well and we're going to keep giving a rotavirus vaccine. Our thought was, well, is there some way that we could use a reverse genetic system um, to uh, make this kind of a dual vaccine where you're not only protecting the children that are being receiving the rotavirus vaccine against rotavirus infections, but at the same time protect them against norovirus infections. Um, so basically, this is, conceptually, this is the easy part. It's really easy, right? Here's rotavirus you heard about from Guido before. It's, you know, it's this double-stranded RNA virus. It should be really easy. All we're talking about is modifying one of the genome segments so that it makes an extra protein. That protein is going to be the capsid protein of norovirus. And by making that capsid protein, it's going to assemble into a virus-like particle. And when you give babies this formula or this particular type of virus, you're going to get two anatypes of antibody responses. Those that are against rotavirus, those against norovirus. Everything's good. Kids no longer go to the hospital due to diarrhea. This is early in life. But some important, before you can do this, some important questions came up uh, that we're all dealing with and we're still trying to discover for the rotavirus system. It's so new that we don't really know what the limits are in particular, but one of them is just how much foreign material sequence material can you introduce into the rotavirus genome, right? So I have to have room to make a 50,000 uh, uh, Dalton protein for norovirus. Somehow I have to re-engineer my viral genome so that I can add that much sequence in. It's not a trivial amount. It's a fair amount. Um, and no one's put that much into the genome yet. It's a new system. Uh, so it's not ex unexpected that no one's done it, but we would have to show uh, if we're going to make this particle that we could actually put that much extra sequence in there. And then the, one of the important things is not only do we have to put the extra sequence in there, but we really need to do it in a way that we're not messing up the function of any of the other rotavirus proteins. I mean, rotavirus still needs to replicate as a vaccine strain. Uh, to grow it up, whatever you need to do. So you need all the viral rotavirus proteins to continue to function, to continue to be expressed. But in addition, you need to produce one more protein and do it at levels well enough um, that you're going to induce uh, an antibody response that's sufficient to provide protection. All right, so and then finally, uh, is this genetically stable? Maybe I can make the virus, but when it comes time to pass the virus up, grow it up, so you make large stock for the virus for vaccine purposes, um, the, the, the genome needs to be stable, right? 
I have to be able to do that. So I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail, just to remind you a little bit about how rotavirus works. Really, the essential part is, is that the incoming particle uh, transcribes its double-stranded RNAs, makes uh, plus-strand RNAs, and these mRNAs serve two functions. They're translated, and they also are replicated. So the reverse genetic system that Guido and the rest of us are using are really faking the first part of this. Uh, what we're really doing is just introducing, using plasmids and so forth, uh, we're introducing into these cells, into cells, uh, T7 transcripts that are made from T7 plasmids, and these plasmids are able through translation and then being used as templates of replication, launching the uh, replication and uh, generating new virus particles. The reverse genetic system that we use is much like the one that Guido uses. We use a capping enzyme. Uh, if you were here this morning, you'll remember that Guido pointed out they weren't very successful using the original system that was described in the literature. We didn't have much success either with that system. Uh, so we went through and made some changes. And one of the changes that we made was to use this plasmid uh, or make a plasma that encodes African swine fever virus capping enzyme. Um, and that idea was not something we came up with. There is a real virus reverse genetic system, and this is in fact the capping enzyme that they are using in their system now that increases the efficiency, uh, increases the, the amount of recombinant virus that's being made. So we, we're using that. In our hands, um, our, we see maybe, uh, a half a log to a log increase in just the amount of recombinant virus that's being made uh, in our transfection systems uh, of recombinant viruses coming out. So it doesn't, for us, it doesn't mean you don't make recombinant virus if you leave it out. It just means that the titer that we get is higher. All right. So one of the key early proteins uh, that I'll mention at this point is uh, a protein that, that we call Unigy. It's really an Agi, but we'll call it Unigy. And Unigy is a small fluorescent green protein. It's the first protein as a test uh, concept. It's the first protein that we've tried to actually engineer into the rotavirus genome to separate, make it as a separate protein and all. So the first part is this is going to talk about putting uh, these kind of fluorescent proteins into the virus how that turned out, and we'll talk more about uh, the current work and where we're actually putting caps of uh, proteins for norovirus and other things into the genome, okay? So the, our favorite gene is uh, gene seven, uh, the gene segment um, double-stranded RNA of rotavirus encodes a protein called NSP3. Um, you don't need to know a lot of details about NSP3 uh, other than probably what's listed here, NSP3 is a viral translation enhancer. It just helps the rotavirus proteins be translated more efficiently. Um, it forms a dimer. Uh, it induces nuclear accumulation of a protein called poly A binding protein. Poly A binding protein is a host protein that's important for translation of host mRNAs. Rotavirus works hard to suppress the activity of that, right? And then, um, we knew from some studies with other uh, types of uh, rotaviruses, group C rotaviruses in particular, um, that in some cases you can find strains of NSP3 uh, or strains of rotavirus that are actually not only expressing NSP3 from segment 7, but it's also expressing a, sep a second protein. And what that allowed us to surmise is that we could actually add extra uh, protein sequences to the end of the NSP3 gene, and that protein would continue to function, which I think conceptually is really important. One of the things about NSP3, we still argue about whether that protein is essential or not, whether it's actually required for the replication of the virus or not. Most, just as a giveaway, most of the things that we have done said it is required, uh, but I don't have a perfect experiment to prove that yet. All right, so what we did was to take our NSP3 gene and uh, we engineered on to the end of it. Uh, as a starting point, we just put Anagi, uh, the Unigy open reading frame, fused it in frame to NSP3, put a flag tag in between so we could pick it up easily. And then we used the reverse genetic system to introduce it back into the, to the virus. We end up with a recombinant virus. 
here's the original wild type virus, here's the modified or the recombinant virus, and now the gene seven that you can see here is actually switched and it's really co-migrating now with gene five here. You can tell the band intensity's really gone up here. And so, yeah, you can make that virus, it works. Uh, this was very exciting when it happened because we had never seen anything like this before, so now it seems hmm, dull, uh, but it actually was a really big deal 18 months ago. And uh, when you infect cells with this virus, you could grow it up, you could do anything you wanted to with it. When you infected cells, you get this nice uh, green fluorescent signal, so we know the virus, is, the green virus is growing and expressing uh, the Anagi gene. Uh, so, in the literature, you'll notice that there are other labs working with uh, other rotavirus genes, and they're putting fluorescent tags in those as well. Uh, one of the things that we fundamentally thought that the NSP3 gene would probably give us higher levels of expression than the NSP1 gene. The NSP1 gene actually encodes an interferon antagonist. There's not a whole lot of it made in the cell, but that's the protein. Uh, the protein product from this particular gene is the protein that people are putting fluorescent tags into and stuff like that. We thought if you really wanted to make a virus that was making a lot of a foreign or common protein, it would be better to do it with NSP3 than NSP1. So, but we thought it's probably best to do the experiment instead of just hypothesize about that. So we, we re-engineered the NSP1 gene to have the same end on it that we had just put on NSP3. Uh, we made the virus. Okay, grows fine. Uh, again, these are fusions. Okay, these are just direct fusions. Um, and then we did uh, some light cell imaging. We may have to cut the lights all the way down on this. And then I'm going to run this. I'm going to set this up a little bit for you. This is going to be a 16 hour light cell image. I'm going to speed it up at some points after I make a couple of points. Here's the NSP1 virus. Here's the NSP3 virus. We're starting at time zero. Uh, two separate infections being run in parallel. Let's see if it starts to go. We're running now. This is one hour. By around two hours, you'll start to see actually the, the signals from the NSP3 showing up. You can start to see them over here. Okay. I'm going to speed this up so you won't fall asleep. All right. So, but if I speed this up and take this to six hours, for example, which in the rotavirus life cycle is pretty early. You can start to see I have no problem at all seeing the green fluorescence over here, and at least if you measure the intensity here is much greater than that. If you go ahead and take this to 12 hours, it becomes very obvious that we have much higher level of expression coming from uh, the, the virus in which we've re-engineered the NSP3 gene instead of the NSP1 gene. So this is our kind of comparison study. This is the one that kind of shows, at least to us, that if you're going to try to make a foreign protein, use a rotavirus to make a foreign protein as in a vaccine, then probably going with the NSP3 gene is the way to go. It works really well. Okay. All right. So the next part of this, we know we can make foreign proteins on NSP3, uh, but that was a fusion protein. And one of the things we want to do is make a separate protein, right? Because we're asking for a virus-like particle to be made. That capsid protein needs to be something expressed by itself so it has the freedom to interact with itself to actually assemble into a particle. So we introduced, we took the same construct we had before, NSP3, flag, Unigy. In this case, we're putting a 2A element into it, okay? A 2A is one of these self-cleavage uh, elements, translational elements. If you put them in a protein uh, in an open reading frame uh, for a long protein, for example, the 2A element, I think it's shown here, will basically cause uh, this rough peptide bond formation at that one particular point, and you can really get two proteins from a single ore. Okay? So that was our thought on how we would actually get the NSP3 gene to go about the business of making a separate foreign protein for us. Okay, and we were able to make the virus. Uh, so here's wild type again. Here's our new recombinant virus that's now expressing this particular gene. And uh, sure enough, uh, it expresses the protein. And it actually turns out that it expresses more in terms of intensity of signal. This intensity is greater than the intensity if you do the fusion protein. And our sense is that that's because in this particular case, um, 
the GFP, the, I'm sorry, the Unigy has the freedom to fold or do whatever it wants to to maximize the uh, signal intensity. So a two-way for us actually gives you a better virus if you're just trying to make viruses that are giving you fluorescent signals, okay? And then I, this is the only Western blot I think I show you, maybe one more. Um, but you have to kind of prove this is working, right? Um, so we're looking for two fragments being generated. And in fact, there it is. There is the NSP3 2A fragment being generated here. And here's the other fragment here. Uh, the, the, what would be the read through if it existed would be up here. I'm not showing that. But in this case, uh, the efficiency of cleavage or 2A function is about 80%. So um, this is working quite well for us. This is a slightly modified 2A element. We could talk about it if anyone has questions about it. Um, but we've, we've kind of made some changes to it a little bit. Okay, so we're now, so now we've expressing a foreign protein and we're doing it as a separate independent protein. Uh, the question was, how much can we add to this? And that's gonna be a question we keep coming back over and over again. This is a fairly small protein here, right? That's not the size of a capsid protein. So, we stepped up the next time we, instead of making something that was about 139 amino acids, we tried these other fluorescent tags, this case uh, MK, which is 236. Um, same scheme, this case we're using the Unigy virus and the wild type virus as control. You can see now we've added enough nucleic acid foreign sequence to gene 7 that instead of migrating here, it's now moved into the fifth position. Uh, if it's a race among your segments, we're getting bigger and bigger. It's down the fifth. Uh, so it's getting pretty large. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to say about that? Okay. Um, then we went on and made the others. So the, the reason these came about is, uh, at least uh, in our university, we, we have rotating graduate students the first year. So they come and spend about six weeks in your lab. And so what I did the first year when I had five graduates, I rotated graduate students coming to the lab, I just gave them each an assignment of making another fluorescent uh, labeled viral viruses. And they apparently loved this. They all have one. They wanted to name them after themselves. Uh, but I said, no, you can't do that. Uh, but anyway, so we made all these. Uh, you can see the CFP, YFP pick. This is a pair that you can use for FRET. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can use these viruses for. If you're trying to do plaque assays, you can now replace them by just doing fluorescent-based signals. You can do live cell imaging. You can do a lot of things. One of the things that we're doing using the green and uh, red viruses, uh, and if you see the yellow viruses showing up, those are co-infections, but we're trying to study the super-infection window. For example, if you infect cells with rotavirus, one strain, how long can those cells remain receptive to being infected by a second virus? That's an important question for a virus like this that can undergo assortment. How long does the window stay open for reassortment between two different strains? When it is color viruses that are like this, really opens the door for those kind of things, okay? That we, and we just didn't have that availability before. All right, so we're trying to think of how to make um, tests for even longer RNA molecules, you know? What can we do? Um, so we started doing duplications. How many fluorescent open reading frames can we add to this one gene? Uh, and in this case, uh, we've taken our original 1100 uh, nucleotide NSP3 gene and we're now changed it to nearly 2400, 2500. So it's more, it's two and a half times longer, nearly two and a half times longer. It's getting big. So can we make this virus? I probably wouldn't be showing you this unless we could. Uh, so now, Here's the wild type, and in fact, now we've moved, made a recombinant virus that's now running in segment position three. These are getting to be big viruses. These are getting, in terms of extra nucleic acids that's being added. And in fact, it is, both of these are being expressed. There is the M. ruby, uh, nice deep red. Uh, the Unagi is being expressed as well, and the combination of those two kind of gives you a muddy orange kind of color. And that's exactly what we're seeing. So but both of these uh, foreign genes are being expressed. So this particular recombinant virus is making not only the 12 viral proteins, but making, making two foreign proteins all off this, uh, with three different proteins coming from the same segment, which is pretty good. All right, uh, as a way of just summarizing some of this, we we're kind of building these kind of profiles for these viruses. The changes that we have made so far to actually increase the coding capacity of the genome 
is using the gene 7, uh, and uh, this kind of ended up here. This one has more data uh, in which you can indicate the original genome size is 18.559 or thereabouts, depending on the strain you're working with. And now uh, by adding M. Ruby and M. Unigy together, you can go up to 19.891, so you're about almost 1,500 bigger now. Uh, and what we've been doing most lately, which works just great, is to actually use two different genes, two different segments, and you put one protein on one segment, another one on the other. Uh, and both of those are possible. So, and in this, the fluorescent kind of work that we're doing, this is the biggest genome that we've been working with, okay? And this works. Again, the caveat is you're gonna get a much stronger red than you are a green, only because NSP3 expresses better than NSP1. Okay. One of the critical things is, is what's going on with the function of NSP3. As I said, we have to maintain the function of all the viral proteins no matter what we're doing, right? So we may be making foreign proteins, but we really need the rotavirus to maintain its ability to grow well. It needs to have all its proteins remaining functional. And I won't go through all of this in great detail, but as I pointed out before, NSP3 is supposed to dimerize, and in fact, uh, we did dimerization experiments, and in fact, here's the wild-type dimer that's being formed, here's the monomer, and we're seeing dimers being formed with the uh, pieces of NSP3 that have an extra piece added to them that's coming from the 2A element. So that's working. Um, the other thing that I pointed out before is rotavirus likes to disrupt the activity of this protein called poly-A binding protein. Uh, and you can tell it's disrupting it because polybinding protein is normally in the cytoplasm. What rotavirus does is it forces it to accumulate in the nucleus, okay? So here's a mock infection. The red signal is this magical polybinding protein. It's all in the cytoplasm. If you, uh, in a viral infection, rotavirus infection, you'll see it's moving into the nucleus. You can see it easier in the costain where you kind of see this pink purplish accumulation in the nucleus. And if you look over here, um, this is the recombinant virus with UNIG, for example, you're seeing that same relocalization of the poly binding protein in the nucleus. So we're pretty sure the NSP3 pretty, is maintaining the functions it has, which we think is really important uh, and uh, is justifies, helps justify the use of NSP3. The problem with putting fluorescent tags into NSP1, and even though we've done it, those almost for sure are inactivating the NSP1 protein. And the NSP1 is an interferon antagonist. That is really going to cripple the ability of that virus to, to grow like it normally would, uh, because it's just not going to be able to prevent the expression of interferon or induction of interferon. Okay, so there, there are many things. We've probably sent out some of the recombinant viruses, I think, to 25 labs now or something, but we've sent a lot of them. Uh, some of these you may have seen. I'll, I'll show you a couple of movies now. I'll show you um, this first one is a movie where someone is looking at Joe Heiser uh, published um, data related to this in the last couple of months. What it's looking at is uh, how, what, NS, what rotavirus does to calcium stores. So one of the things that we've known about rotavirus is that it actually causes release of calcium from infected cells, okay? But we've never been able to image what that really means. You know, are the surrounding cells picking it up? How far is that signaling taking place due to the release of calcium? So what Joe Heiser did uh, was to take our, in this case, one of our green viruses, the virus expressing Unagi, uh, and he took MA104 cells, which is our favorite cell line for growing rotaviruses in, and he took a cell line in which he had transformed them so that they were expressing a red calcium sensitive protein. So when this calcium, red calcium sensitive protein sees calcium, it's going to send out a signal. And you're going to see this, it's going to look like uh, you're having a thunderstorm, okay? And so I'll show you this, this is a simplified slide, and then we'll go to something that's a little more complicated. Uh, and you, what you want to do is look up in this area, you'll see something show up, it's green, it's going to show up, and then you'll see the fireworks that take place around it, okay? All right, so I forget what the time course is for this one. There's the little green cell showing up. Uh, now we're going to start to get calcium release in a second. It'll become obvious. There it goes. Uh, so you can see all the cells around it 
are being exposed or somehow are responding, their red calcium sensitive proteins are responding to calcium being released from the infected cell. Um, I'm not a calcium expert, but calcium signaling has a lot of impacts on the physiology of the cell. It has effects on cytoskeleton organization, probably has effects on uh, interferon signaling pathways, innate immune responses, and so forth. As you can imagine, that one infected cell is definitely sending out a signal that's in the neighborhood, but not further up. So we suddenly have a whole new set of neighboring cells that are responding to a signal that helps them know the proximity of the viral infection or whatever is going on. It's a very interesting study. Okay, so this is going to be more complex, uh, and we're reversing the colors this time. This time, Joe Hydra set up a system in which the cells, the MA104 cells, are uh, expressing a green uh, calcium sensitive protein. Okay, so it's going to be green flashes that you see this time instead of what we saw last time. And the virus in this case is an MK virus, so you're looking for, for red appearance. And remember, if you get the two together, you're going to see green and red, which is going to be yellow. So if you see yellow, I think you track the colors. This is mock. These two, uh, so, and this is being done with three different concentrations, amount of, of virus. These become bewildering really fast. So I would just focus on this one. This one is done at low MOI. You can start to kind of appreciate what's going on by watching this one. Okay, so here we'll start it. Mock, not much going on here. It's just gone crazy in, in no time at all. Um, and here's a low MOI, and you can see all these little localized thunderstorms taking place. All this calcium signaling going on, uh, then it'll eventually become overwhelming. Uh, this is during a 15-hour infection. You can see the red infected cell, but isn't that cool? So you can, this is something you can do with these kind of colored viruses. Before, we didn't know which cells were infected. We might see flashes, but how was I going in a live cell sort of way, know how often these flashes occur, know how many cells are being affected, and how was I going to know where the infected cell actually was sitting? Right? So all these things become possible now, and, and now we look through catalogs looking for um, indicator reporter proteins that we can use in our cell lines to do these kind of studies. Right? Okay, now for back to the heart of the matter though, can we make a rotavirus that will produce uh, a capsid protein that will assemble into a virus-like particle? So uh, the subject at hand in this particular case is taking our rotavirus and now re-engineering it so it has nearly 2 kb of new nucleic acid in it, okay? That's a lot. 2 kb, so that we're actually moving the genome to a nearly 20 kb size. It's now more than 10% of the size it's going to be, okay? And here's norovirus, a simplified structure. It consists of only a single protein. Single protein makes it. All right, and so Asha re-engineered this, made this. I, of course, said this is never going to work. Uh, and, of course, it worked because Asha knows what she's doing. Um, here's my wild-type virus. And now here's, there's a new segment up here. We've lost this segment. There's now a new segment. It is the largest segment the virus has. Uh, and it's actually encoding. I don't know if I even have the gel for that. But it's encoding um, the capsid protein of norovirus. Okay. The, uh, you can't see it here very well. One of the important things about... Um, these kinds of viruses, like noroviruses, they all assemble in somewhat the same route. The first thing they do is form a dimer, and then the dimers uh, assemble into a more complex structure. And that's what we were checking here, and in fact, they're all forming dimers. So it looks very positive in terms of these things ultimately uh, making virus-like particles. But that's where we are now. We haven't actually pulled out of the infected cells and looked for whether or not the virus-like particles are here. We suspect they're here. If they're not, we'll probably have to change it around a little bit. But usually when you get to this point, these are, these, the, this structure of norovirus is very much, as long as you can express the protein, they self-assemble self really efficiently. So we think that's going to be good. So they didn't really still tell us what our upper limit is. Really, how big can you put something in there? What's the maximum size? So we went to astrovirus. Astrovirus has a 2.5 kb uh, uh, capsid protein. Really big, okay? Really big. And it actually, uh, one protein will assemble into the astrovirus 
uh, into an astrovirus virus like particle. It's much more complex though, because there's self cleavage events that are going to take place. Uh, so this is a test of other types of things in addition to uh, not just making the virus. If you're not just making a rotavirus that can express this capsid protein, but also whether uh, the expression of this itself is going to give us what we want. Right? So, but we made the virus, I mean, uh, we made the construct. That construct, here's what you started with, with 1.1 kb. We're now up to 3.6 kb, um, three and a half times the size of what you started with. Realize the virus here that we started with is this one virus that's an icosahedral. It's not like it can get bigger by itself. When we started in this project, we assumed that, of course, a rotavirus is going to stuff as much nucleic acid as possible into its suitcase. Why not, right? Why not fill it as much stuff? Rotavirus, what we're finding out, is not doing that. It's got a lot of extra room in it. We still don't know what the upper limit of that is. But it certainly is enough to hold on to um, this 2.5 kb of extra genetic material. So here it is up here. All right, so we've gone from seven to this largest one up here. Now Oscar, because he's got a sharp eye, is actually going to notice the intensity of this band is a little bit less than the other bands, okay? Uh, and we can argue about what that means. Our interpretation of that is, in fact, that is not as genetically stable as you would like and that you are starting to see some uh, rearrangements of that segment uh, and that they're showing up in the background here somewhere. We don't know where they are, uh, but there is a little bit of a genetic stability sort of thing. One of my favorite experiments uh, that we did in the lab, I don't know if you can ever publish it, but it's fun to, to see what happens. Um, if, you're doing, if you're purifying viruses, you know you can purify them using cesium chloride gradients. You can purify viruses based on density, right? And density in the case of an RNA virus is based upon mass per volume. RNA is very heavy. If you add a lot more RNA, you should see the density increase dramatically. And in fact, this is a mixture of wild type rotavirus with uh, rotavirus that are encoding a consensus astrovirus VP90 RNA. And you can see that it's dropped uh, uh, considerably in density. That's actually a useful piece of information. We're, in, we're actually packaging this stuff, right? It's actually ending up in the virus. We're not just replicating it. It is in, being put in the virus. So it says something about the true capacity of that core. It's actually holding this nucleic acid, at least for a while. If it's genetically stable, you may lose this. But at least at the initial part, it was there, OK? So this, in a kind of a, a way of summarizing some of this, uh, this is the largest virus that we've made so far in the lab. It's, a, it's 21, uh, 607 in terms of base pairs in length, which is um, 3,000. Uh, it's considerably longer um, than what we started with. Uh, we can tell we're getting to the limits, right? Uh, and we can tell that based upon the stability issues that we're starting to run into, which I'll discuss just right now. Okay, so, Genetic stability for, rotav uh, for rotaviruses, you test the stability pretty much the same way you do any rock virus, which you start passing it. Uh, you pass the virus serially uh, over and over and over. Uh, we thought five was sufficient until reviewers told us, no, you need to do it 10 times. So uh, we, we did it. This is the original UNIG virus. It's actually got you know, the insert in, that, insert in that one. It's not all that large. But nonetheless, at least through 10 rounds of serial passage, this was remarkably stable, right? Uh, and in fact, everything, all, all the viruses that we've made that have fluorescent tags in them, at least the ones with a single tag in them, like MK or MRuby or whatever else, those have all seemed quite stable during serial passage. On the other hand, um, if you start trying to grow up some of, this, is, this was given to me right at the last minute, so I'm still trying to figure out parts of this slide. Um, but if you start taking the viruses that have the capsid proteins being engineered to them, and you start to pass them, um, you start to see some instability, which means to me we've got to learn how to grow this a little bit differently. We can change temperatures. There are a lot of little things you do with the first generation attempt. But we are seeing viruses that are kicking out uh, portions of the fluorescent thing. So 
This particular virus, it has the norovirus VP1 in it. Uh, in the big scheme of things, it's pretty stable. This is, you know, we have to pass it a lot to, to find this. This is pretty good, so this is easy to fix. I don't think this is a big challenge in terms of making the virus uh, that might encode uh, or be able to make a virus like particle that makes norovirus. The bigger challenge is uh, uh, the one that has the astrovirus VP90 in it. It's really not a happy virus. So even though I can show you the cesium chloride slide, uh, the, the, the gradient with the cesium, uh, cesium chloride gradient that has the recombinant virus in it that has 2.5 kb of extra material in it, in fact, that virus is not in love with that extra genetic information. And it, it works pretty hard to kick it out. And we're seeing all kinds of different ways that it kicks it out. Uh, we're, we're accumulating information, we're sequencing to try to figure out what are the clues, are there particular areas where things get kicked out. We do know in all cases we've never seen a situation where we kicked out NSP3. So if there are two cleavage sites, and it seems like there probably has to be to do this, right? Um, one of them is somewhere, but the other one is never within the NSP3 open reading frame. This kind of data suggests to us that you probably really do need the NSP3 open reading frame for this virus to replicate, um, because I don't see a reason that it would avoid it. Uh, for NSP gene 5, for example, NSP1, there's never a problem with the virus going ahead and rearranging into that open reading frame. So the way I interpret this is probably there is a selection against disrupting the NSP3 open reading frame. One of the curious deletions that we've been seeing is this really tiny deletion that is occurring in the, uh, in the 2A region, okay? And it's only 18 base pairs. That keeps things in frame, right? So we can still read down through here. I thought maybe it's kicking out or creating an ORF there or something, but it's not, right? It just kicks out basically the equivalent of six amino acids and then keeps going, right? We don't know where that pressure is coming from. It's an interesting pressure. You're going to have some sort of recombination, two cleavages. Somehow something's taking place at that site, and it's very consistent. These are four different isolates that Asha has, uh, plaque isolates that she then to pass some, and then these are the recombinant uh, unusual double-stranded RNAs that are showing up here. Here's the, this one here for the A1 with its missing 18 base pairs. Uh, she hasn't analyzed this one here, uh, and then she's analyzed the two here. And again, they're just mostly just large deletions within the, uh, um, the VP90 region in this particular case. Okay? Um, it, it's interesting, um, some of the do, do, uh, deletions that we're seeing actually are going into the uh, 3 prime UTR. Okay? Some of them run further in than others, uh, but uh, certainly in, in re-engineering our viruses, we know that we can delete half of the 3' prime UTR and the virus still replicates fine. We don't know what the UTR's functions are all about, but we find it remarkable that you can have a highly conserved sequence, and the UTRs have very highly conserved sequences, and remove half of them and still have the virus replicate, uh, as far as we can tell, without being crippled in any sort of way. Um, so we'll still have to figure that out. Okay, uh, to summarize, so the rotavirus genome uh, we know can encapsulate uh, 2.5 kb or more of foreign sequence, and it's actually into the virion itself, okay, or I couldn't have purified that virus, right? Um, the second thing is, is that we know rotavirus can express multiple foreign proteins uh, at the same time, either on the same segment or on two different segments, okay? That opens the doors on how you might re-engineer the virus, even if it's just for tools in the laboratory. Um, but that capacity really uh, provides a lot of avenues for trying to study the biology of the virus. You can use one of them. It's almost like um, if you've used the uh, luciferase kit for one of them is the green and one of them is the ranella, uh, you can put them both in here, for example, and you can introduce mutations or use one as a readout of the expression of one protein and the other becomes your baseline control. You can use this and convert a lot of your assays that you do based into a button color-based assay system. Re-engineered NSP3 segments express more than one for, pro, uh, more than for, for pro, sorry, express more foreign protein than similar NSP1 segments. 
And from our measurements, that looks like it's probably two to three times higher. The other thing you may not have noticed as you're going through the, the movie there, during the 16-hour movie, it looks like to us that actually NSP1 goes up to a point and then kind of stops. And NSP3 keeps powering to the end. Um, that's not something we've really thought about before. It's one of the reasons we're really hoping we can get tags into more proteins. Because in fact, by live cell imaging, we can get a much better impression of how the levels of protein expression compare from gene to gene. I don't think they're all just going up equally. I think some of them are being regulated. And, and certainly, the color-based technologies are really going to power up how we can actually study the biology of these viruses uh, in terms of the expression of foreign proteins. Okay, certainly MSP3 is remaining functional, even with the addition of C-terminal sequences. We put a lot of things at the end of MSP3, and we have yet to see an, an impact, uh, a noticeable thing. Uh, and we've looked through all the, the assay systems that have been used for MSP3 in terms of trying to study its function. So if there's something going on, we don't know what it is yet. But MSP3 seems to be pretty darn happy, uh, even if you put things at the C-terminal center. And that's different than NSP1. I don't know if you can do that with NSP1, you're going to lose the other one. So this may be the only gene, it certainly is the only gene I'm aware of at this point, that if you wanted to put a tag onto a protein just to monitor the replication of the virus, this is the only gene that you can use for that without affecting the expression of the other, uh, some other protein. And then uh, foreign sequences that are larger than 2 kb look to be the point where, where we're starting to run into trouble. Okay, so that's about 10% of the genome. When you start to add more than that, it's not that it can't get packaged. We don't really know where the interference takes place. It would help if we knew what the basis of the lesions were, rearrangements, right? We don't know how you do that for this virus. When you have genetic instability, how are you dumping a portion of the genome? How does that take place? Um, it is interesting that we can isolate some natural occurring mutant rotaviruses that have naturally occurring deletions in them, and they're remarkably stable. In fact, they're preferred over things that we can make artificially. So there must be biases, one way or the other, that connect to what the RNA sequence is that you're adding extra to these things. And you, there clearly have to be, there probably are signals that can be added into the extra that you're adding that in fact are an advantage to the virus or provide an advantage to the segment so that it's being selected for. Everything that we've done so far, at least when you get about 2 kb, that advantage is not there, right? So we're losing it. But we're hoping that with the reverse genetic system, we can figure out what, what the nature of that positive selection is so that for these viruses where you're trying to make a vaccine or something like that, we can re-engineer them uh, so that they're a little happier with the extra genetic information they have in them. Um, okay, so I'll just end with this. This is my group. Um, this is Asha. As I said, she did really all the work in about the last 18 months. Uh, we work on a lot of different things. I have to thank uh, Maya, uh, who actually put us on to the using African swine fever virus capping enzyme. Um, she spent a lot of time optimizing, improving the real bar system that turned out to be really useful to us. Uh, we have a nice uh, collaboration going with Joe Heiser. Joe Heiser has set up to do live cell imaging over many hours for free uh, for us. Uh, around our place, we pay like $300 an hour uh, to do live cell imaging, which works out fine if you're working for bacteria because in 20 minutes they're done with everything. For us, we're going 16 times 300 uh, before you know it. Uh, the, the students aren't getting paid that month. Um, anyway, and then our support and things like that. But um, that's my story. Um, hopefully next year we'll know whether or not we actually have the virus particles that are being made, which I think is an important step forward. Okay, thank you.